We looked at three different methodologies for location planning. So if you're preparing for an exam that might have location planning on it, one of the challenges is, okay, that's a location planning problem. Which of the three methodologies am I supposed to use? Now we can see that with this first question. Let's take a look at it. Phi Upsilon Nu, a student social organization, has three different locations under consideration for the construction of a new chapter house. Funds president and management student estimates that due to differing land costs, utility rates, both fixed and variable costs, see how I was obsessing about that, would be different for each of the three proposed locations. So these are the candidates and obsession, obsession, fixed and variable costs. Now wait, why is that so important? Because if a location planning problem is giving you fixed and variable costs, that means it's one of those cost volume analysis problems. So you're thinking, oh no, we're going to have to draw a graph. That was cost volume analysis. And there's going to be these zones and we're going to have to find points of indifference. And the answer is for this, yeah, probably we are. Although always see how far you can wade into a scenario without having to do like the full-blown analysis because look at this right here which what would be the following total monthly costs for the Main Street location with 20 people living at it you don't need a graph see all you do is retrieve 5,200 times 20 the information for that location oh you get 9,000 uh, get 9,000, don't mark that. Don't mark that, right? And uh, well, you said, yeah, I know, because you gave me the answers first, and 9,000 is D. Ah, one thing about test taking, I try to be good about this. I had obsessed about it previously. See the arrow? It's asking for total monthly costs. Okay, 9,000 is a wicked distractor because notice that the 5,000 is an annual cost. These are annual costs. This is the annual cost at Main Street that I get. Now in order to answer the question, I just have to divide by 12, no problem, to divide it out over months. That's where we get the 750. Okay, so that is kind of just interpretation of the data. I mean we didn't need a graph for that. Now, maybe we need a graph for this. What would be the total annual cost for either Main Street or Minnesota Avenue at funds point of indifference between the two locations? Now it's true we were looking at points of indifference on a graph, but you don't need a graph to answer that question because it's only asking about one of them in particular. So I'm going to grab a piece of paper for scratch work. It's asking for the point of indifference between Main Street and Minnesota Avenue, meaning I would not care if I was either at these two places. Well, this is all about costs, so that means I wouldn't care if the cost of being here equaled the cost of being here. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Well, what's the cost of being here at Main Street? We were just doing that. You have to pay 5000 every year, regardless of however many people are living there, plus you have to pay $200 for each person that's living there, and you know, I don't know how many people are going to be living there. It wasn't said. But when is that the same thing as Minnesota Avenue paying $8,000 every year, but getting a break on the variable costs? Okay, well, oh, oh, I solved for X. Okay, well that's like what, 50X equals 3000 X comes out nice and neat. Cool, 60. What's that mean? It means that Fun's point of indifference is 60 people. If 60 people are living at the house, they don't care whether they're at Main Street or Minnesota Avenue because it happens to be the exact same cost. So you go, okay, great, I got 60. Mark the question, and now we don't even see the choice in here. You know, well, wait a minute. Because they're asking for the total annual cost at the point of indifference. Oh, it's not that we were wrong, but there's one more step here. Because take that 60 and substitute it in there or substitute it in here. It doesn't matter. You'd better get the same answer in either case. Uh, I used Minnesota Avenue, so I just said 8,000 plus 150 times 60, right? So I get this bill of 17,000 annually. That's that. That's the answer. Now, oh, all right, that one's done. If it is estimated that 30 persons will be living at the new chapter house, which location should fund select? 
you know, you don't need a graph for this either. Oh, because this question right here is similar, similar to the, what we were calling the easy case in class, where you're trying to pick a location and somebody is telling you the volume. There'll be 30 people living there. You don't need a graph. You just need a little contest between each of the three locations. Right? If 30 people are living there, let's see, Main Street, I think I can do the scratch work here. What would it cost? I just substitute in the 30 that I'm given. I get $11,000 for Main Street. Uh, and then the issue is, well, is Minnesota Avenue better? Well, 8,000 plus 150 times the 30. I get 12,500. Okay, that's cost. That is not better than that. So Minnesota Avenue is not better, but maybe the low fixed cost at Maple Road will be worthwhile. 2,000 plus, wait a minute, ooh, 500 times each of the 30 people. I get that the total cost at Maple Road would be 17,000. This is a contest. We're just looking for the best one, which is the lowest. Well, that's Main Street, right? That's the answer. So we didn't need to draw a graph for that one either. So we've gotten all the way down to the bottom before, yeah, we need to draw a graph. Now, how do I know? Notice this last question for the scenario. Question four, which of the following is a true statement about Maple Road? Fun shouldn't choose Maple Road no matter how many or how few people will be living in the new chapter house. Fun should definitely choose Maple Road if at least 61 people are living there or at least nine people or no more than nine people or something between 11. Notice that this question is not asking about one certain number of people, like 30. It is proposing ranges. No, because the no matter how many is a range, right? Just no. Or at least 61 is 61 people or 62 people or 500 people or 5,000. At, at the point that you have ranges, you don't have a specific volume given. You do need to draw a graph. We need to see what's going on at this point. So we got this far. It's time for the graph. All right, we're going to illustrate funds situation. The problem is we don't know how many persons will be living there. The concern is cost. Persons, which is volume, versus annual cost. All right, now I need a scale. So here, let's go one, two, quarter inch. Get a nice number of scale going here. Let's see, and what are we going to need to do? We'll make that 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 120. I don't think they probably have many more members than that. If we need more, we'll number them. Then here, going to borrow the same quarter inch scale, but the interpretation is different. Let's make each one of these $2,000 annually. 2000 4000 right? Because I'm going every other, other one. No, whoops, excuse me. No, 4000 6000 8000 This is 10000 So that's... 12,000, that's 14,000, so that is 16,000, so that one is 18,000, so that is 20,000, that's probably plenty high. Okay, so now what do we need to do? We need to illustrate each one of the locations. By illustrate, I mean illustrate the cost associated with each one of the locations. So we start with one of them. Who's at the top of the list? Main Street. Okay, and we ask ourselves, what's the fixed cost associated with Main Street? 5,000, great. Because that would be right here. If nobody, that's what this is, a zero, is living at Main Street, it costs us $5,000. Now, the costs associated with Main Street are linear. So if I find one more point on this line, I have found the line and I have found Main Street. 
uh, I could figure out what the cost is for any one of these other numbers, or I could remember that actually that has already been done for a particular number right here. The question before, we figured out specifically that the cost of 30 people living at Main Street is $11,000. 30 people is right here on my graph. There's 10,000, there's 12,000, 11,000 would be right in the middle. This is what, label it immediately so we don't confuse it with anybody else, this is what Main Street looks like. Okay, now we have to do all three of them. Who's next? Next is on the table, Minnesota Avenue. Fixed cost is 8,000. Oops. Fixed cost is 8,000. Fixed cost is 8,000. Gotta remember that. Fixed cost is 8,000. And if 30 people are living there, the total cost was 12,500. That's 12,000 on my graph. So 12,500 is just like barely above that. So connect those two points. and label, that's Minnesota Avenue. Now, the thing about Maple Road, which is ironically what the question was about, is it has very low fixed costs, which means that if you locate there and nobody moves in, it's only 2,000 a year. Problem is, if 30 people moved in, we already know that the total cost annually is $17,000, which would be right in between 16 and 18 right here. Ah, yes, the high variable cost is yielding a very steep total cost line. The, I gotta label it, costs at Maple are escalating rapidly as more people move into the chapter house. Oh, all right, now, remember from this technique in general that I'm not interested in any one of those lines in particular. I am interested in who is the lowest line across the graph because that is indicating where we would want to be over that particular range of numbers. And I can already see, even with my hand-drawn graph here, no graph paper, just free-handed, right? I can already see that there's some kind of zone in here, but it's going to be tiny numbers, like single digits, that you would prefer maple. There's another zone in here in which kind of like is in the middle, you would prefer that's Main. And that makes sense because Main Street was picked for the 30. And then as long as you've got enough people, there's some sort of flipping point that if enough people move in, even though it has a high fixed cost, Minnesota Avenue starts to pay off because of its low variable cost. Oh, all right. Now, I have my graph and you're thinking, okay, fine. Now I've got to find the exact points of indifference. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't, if you know how to interpret the graph, actually we can get away with not doing that because fun shouldn't choose Maple Road no matter how many or how few. I can kick that out because I can see that there is something for really small numbers where you would prefer Maple, so that can't be true. Fun should definitely choose Maple Road if at least 61 people will be living in the chapter house. Now, I wouldn't trust my number line exactly because it's free-handed, but nonetheless, at least 61 is 61, 120, 500. I mean, all these things fit that description. And, um, wait a minute, I, that you definitely are not near the Maple Road preferable zone. You can kick that out, that's nonsense. You'd want to be at Minnesota Avenue for big numbers. Fun should definitely choose Maple Road if at least nine people, this is the same problem except worse. It's backing up in here, maybe you would prefer it, but it's indicating everything. No, you wouldn't want to be at Maple for most of that. Let's see, Fun should definitely choose Maple Road if no more than nine people are living at the chapter house. Hmm, oh, I'm intrigued. No more than nine persons. I'm not sure what the exact point of indifference is here, right? I wouldn't trust my sketched uh, number line, but I can see that very small numbers, Maple Road would be preferable. Now, very small numbers, Maple Road would be preferable. No more than nine is nine, eight, seven, six, all the single digits. That fits that description. 
So I'm not going to kick it out. Maybe I'll come back to it. Fun should definitely choose Maple Road if at least 11, but no more than 59 people. Okay, that means kind of like in the middle here. At least 11 and no more than 59. Includes 30 where we already know you'd want to be at Main Street. So that can't possibly be true. So there. We know that the answer is D. Small numbers, at least nine. Now you can, if you would like, find the exact points of indifference and state it definitively. I do believe, if memory serves me correctly, that the point of indifference between Main Street and Maple, my graph here came out pretty good, right, is 10. So at 10, you'd be indifferent. Below it, you'd want to be at Maple. Above it, you want to be Main, except we already did figure out the point of indifference here between Main Street and Minnesota Avenue. Do you remember that? That was the 60. Okay. All right. Now, that was cost volume analysis. There's still two more old exam questions. Are they the same methodology? Okay, question five. Consider the following map of six cities indicated by six dark number points. For instance, that one, that one, this one, this one, this one, or this one. Okay. The five light colored points labeled A through E are five candidate locations for a new warehouse. Five candidate locations for a new house, warehouse, meaning you could put it here, you could put it here, you could put it here, here, or here, that will ship to the six cities. So we're going to pick one of these points and figure out from that point we are going to ship to the cities. All right. Oh, wait, and there's more information. Suppose that the monthly amount shipped to each of the cities is as follows. There's 800 tons of City 1, there's 300 to City 2, 200 to City 3, 200, 400, 100. Given the shipping information, which candidate location should be selected for the new Hera House? That's the answer that we're trying to find. This is a center of gravity problem, right? There's a grid. You know, what's the symptoms? There is a series of destinations they need to be served. We're just trying to pick one point to serve all of them. We've reduced this to a grid like it was a game board. That's center of gravity. You say, oh, all right, well, then what do I need to do? Uh, first off, uh, we need to get organized here. Maybe I can squeeze it in here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, good. I left myself enough room. We have six cities. I don't want to work with that paragraph. I'd rather work kind of like with a table. So I'm going to make myself a little table here. Now, what's going to go on the table? Remember center of gravity? You reduce everything to a game board so that you could find the x and the y coordinates of each one of your destinations. You say, oh, all right, but the grid doesn't have any numbers on it. Ah, that's not stopping us. We can, we'll number it. We'll number it. I'm going to number it where this is zero, and then I'm just going to count whole numbers. You could number it any way you liked. You don't have to adopt my methodology. You will come to the same conclusion if you do it accurately. Anyway, but this is probably the most convenient. Okay, because, now, wait a minute, where is City 1? City 1 is here. That means that, according to now my grid, right, the x-coordinate for City 1 is 0, and the y-coordinate is 10, so 0, 10. For City 2, where is City 2? City 2, the x-coordinate is 5, the y-coordinate is 3. Then for City 3, 9, and 9. For City 4... 10 and 2 for city 5. Where is city 5? Oh, right, right in here, 1 and 2. And then for city 6, what is that? Oh, we're all the way up to 14 on the x-axis, but we're only up to 1. Oh, all right. Now, I found the x and y coordinates, and if, in fact, each one of the cities was to receive a equal shipment, then all I'd need to do is average those to find the ideal or optimal location. But they're not equal, right? There's all this information about different shipping amounts. It's easier to put it in a table. Okay, what did it say? Hey, 800 to city one, 800. Then 300 to city two, 300. 200 to city three, 200. 200 to city four, 
four, 100 to city five, and 100. See, I'd much rather work with this table. Oh, all right, because I need to, now wait, what is center of gravity? I need to find the absolute best point. That's what center of gravity does, the absolute best point for the warehouse. And how do I do that? By finding the weighted average of these coordinates. Uh, the weighted average of these coordinates, little uh, area down here for scratch work, would be, for instance, in the case of the x-coordinate, would be each individual x-coordinate multiplied by the shipping amount. So that's 0 times 800 plus 5 times 300 plus 9 times 200. Oh, we got to wrap here a little bit. Plus 10 times 200. Plus, I'm just going to write 400. 1 times 400. Plus 14 times 100 or 1400. Right? 14 times 100. Um, okay, wait a minute. In the formula for center of gravity, that's the numerator. The denominator is not the number of cities. The denominator is the total amount that's shipped. Well, if you add up these numbers, we're talking about shipping a total of 2,000. That's what goes in the denominator, that 2,000. So, I get that this whole business in the numerator that I wrote adds up to... 7,100 and the denominator to 2,000. So I get about 3.55 for the, that's the perfect X coordinate. The perfect Y coordinates the same template of computations. You just say the Y coordinate times the amount. So in this case I'd say 10 times 800, right, plus 3 times 300, I'm just going to write 900, plus 9 times 200, so what's that, 1800, plus 2 times 200, what's that, 400, plus, where are we, 2 times 400, what's that, 800, plus 1 times 100 is 100, that's all in the numerator, right, I've got the six cities, the denominator's the same, the total amount that's shipped, so for this, I get the numerator comes out to 12,000 flat, so this comes out nice and even, divided by 2006. Oh, which means that the perfect location, supposedly, theoretically, perfect would be 3.55 and 6. I'm just copying my answer here. And I'm still trying to find which candidate location. We'll find the 3.55 and the 6. Well, it's like right in there somewhere. You know, well, there's no point A, B, C, whatever there. Yeah, uh, but they're saying that, and this is a more realistic, you know, uh, application of center of gravity. You know, this is where they have options to actually rent a warehouse. Okay, so given that it has to be at one of these five points, and that's the absolute perfect point, I mean, duh, which one's closest? Right? Which one would you recommend based on this information? Well, it would be that one. It would be B. There. So, answered. Center of gravity. Now, next question. Best purchase must select a location for a new store. Best purchase has, identifi has identified five factors as important to store location. Land cost, road access, population density, average income, zoning laws. They feel that each of these factors is the same importance to the new store location decision with the exception of cost, which it feels is twice as important. Uh, this particular question says factor rating analysis. That was the third methodology that we looked at, right, in class. But even if it didn't mention factor rating analysis, the fact that it's talking about these factors and their relative importance to each other is the giveaway that, that uh, is a, it's about that methodology. Now, they're asking for us to propose the weight for land cost. The best way to do this again is to stop dealing with this paragraph and make our own table. Because what are the five factors? Land cost? I'm just recopying. Road access? 
population density, average income, and zoning, zoning laws. Okay, these are the five. Now I'll go ahead and write it. Now, we want a weighting scheme that adds up to one. Now remember that, because that's the convention, right? And it's the most intuitive and reliable way to do it. We want weights for these that add up to one. Um, we want the weights to reflect the fact that Best Purchase thinks of all of these things as being basically the same amount of importance, meaning they would have the same weight except for land cost. And land cost is twice as important as any one of the other ones. The easiest way to do this, once you have this list, is ask yourself, okay, well, of everything that was described, who's the least important? I mean, who's the lesser important? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a four-way tie. Each of these things is less important than land cost. Just give them a temporary weight of one. That's meant to be a one, and that's meant to be a one. Now, land cost. What do they say about land cost? Twice as important. That means its temporary number would be twice as much as any one of these, or two, right? Okay, now why am I doing that? Because now I want to add up this list. Now remember, that's a one and that's a one. One and one. Two plus one plus one plus one plus one. Now wait a minute, this all adds up to six. Why am I doing that? Because here's your weights. Take that six and multiply each one of the temporary weights by that. And you will have a scheme in which when you add these up, they will add up to one. This, two six or one third or .333 is exactly twice as much as any one of these other ones and these other ones are all equal to each other meaning that Best Purchase doesn't really consider any one of the other four to be any more important than uh, any one of the other four.